Thank you so much for coming. I'm Dina Salina. I'm the director of Oxy Arts here at Occidental College. Um, and I am thrilled uh, to present Amita Smotavali as our speaker for today's Oxy Arts Speaker Series. The Oxy Arts Speaker Series is um, made possible through the generous funding of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, just a couple other things before we get started. If you uh, turn over your info sheet, we have a listing of upcoming Oxy Arts Speaker Series artists and also um, upcoming art Oxy Arts events. So next on um, November 27th, we have Zachary Drucker coming as our speaker. Uh, she is a writer, performer, and visual artist, one of the producers of Transparent. Also, uh, then next semester on uh, January 29th, we have Anthony Ortega and the Quetzalcoatl Mural Project. They're a local mural arts collective. And then finishing up on February 26th, Justin Chong, who's a filmmaker, who has a film out right now um, about the Korean and Korean American experience during the 92 riots. So I hope that you can come to some of those. Also, Chicana Photographers LA is on display now in the Weingart Gallery. It's a really beautiful exhibition that is co that is uh, curated by Sybil Venegas, who's teaching in the Art and Art History Department now, and is a, a co-presentation by Oxy Arts and Avenue 50 Studios. Um, and I invite Allegra Padilla, our coordinator of community programs for CCBL, ISLA, and Oxy Arts to talk about another event. Hi, good evening everyone, how are you? Happy to see you all. So um, as coordinator of community programs, I'm here to start building connections to help break that oxy bubble, which we do break out of at points in time. So as many of you may know, um, Occidental purchased a building on the corner of York and Armdale a couple of years ago. So what's going to be happening, uh, it used to be a liquor store, it's across from Choice Burgers, and it's currently under construction. So what's going to be happening is that Oxy Arts is going to be responsible for the programming in that space. There's going to be two places to eat. And what's happening is in November on the 14th and the 18th, we have two workshops where anyone and everyone who lives, works, creates in the community can come give us feedback of what they might want to see in this space. So I'm going to pass along this sign-in sheet. It's for our general email list, but then you can also um, put a check where we could give you a reminder when these workshops are going to be. So we're going to be doing these workshops this semester and next semester, but it's a really, I think, unique opportunity for people to have a very <coughs> strong presence and voice in this entire process. So thank you all for listening. If you see me around campus, always feel free to flag me down and say hi. All right, thank you. Great. So without further ado, we'll get to the meat of the matter. I'd love to introduce Amita Sanvali, who's a uh, multidisciplinary visual artist living and working in LA. She's also the director of the William Grant Still Art Center and director of the LA Islam Arts Initiative. to painting, 
to um, gatherings, to dialogue, to, um, to non-action, I mean, all of it. So it's just gonna jump all over the place. And I want you to be able to kind of see a, a, a link between everything. And iconoclasm, basically what, what took me into thinking about iconoclasm was referencing an aesthetic history that was my own. And I tried, I was working in sculpture and uh, working in my various art classes and I was really trying to reference European art history but it felt very, very um, foreign to me. It just wasn't something that was familiar and comfortable and, um, and brought me to a place that was, um, that was critical, you know? And so I really needed to reference the history and aesthetic that I grew up with. And a lot of that comes obviously from Iran. It comes from Islamic art. It comes from ancient Iranian art, contemporary Iranian art, the aesthetic of family, the aesthetic of, of tradition, the aesthetics around, um, around public, uh, public gatherings and public rituals, all of that that existed in, in, um, in not only uh, Iran, but also then the neighborhoods that I grew up in, in Los Angeles. And um, some of what I would see in like, let's say Fragonard would be present, but very rarely. And so that was not something that I was going to um, refer to. And so I just kind of want to go over iconoclasm here in case anyone doesn't know what it is. And I did put a definition of it up there. The action of attacking or assertively rejecting cherished beliefs and institutions or established values and practices. And that's um, what I have consciously and unconsciously ended up doing in most of my work. So I'm going to start with very, very early uh, pieces. And I'm going to go all the way to grad school. So. Um, in grad school, I was, I was um, my first year, I was just kind of playing around with mediums, and um, I had always been playing around with, with medium that, that wasn't what I would typically find in a sculpture studio or, or in an art studio period. So um, the year before I went to grad school, I graduated from San Francisco State. I minored in uh -huh. studies. And while I was there, I got to study with this incredible teacher, Angela Davis, and some of you guys may have heard of her. But once she was there, uh, I, I got to even be her TA. And she had me do little hand sculptural projects with the students because we were we had a class that was called Women in Violence. And it was so extremely devastating that we had to actually get our hands on things all the time. So, um, so we were doing this. And during that time, she was also um, organizing strip clubs in the Bay Area, in San Francisco in particular. And there was one called the Lusty Lady that she was organizing. And I just happened to break up with my boyfriend and kick him out of the apartment that we <laughs> shared with him. And then I was like, oh shit, why did I do that? Um, I can't afford this rent. So I was trying to figure out ways, I already had a full-time job while going to school, and I was trying to figure out ways to, to raise money so that I can afford my rent. She said, well, why don't you get a job at the Lusty Lady? So I did. So uh, I got a job at the Lusty Lady. I lasted there for about a week because it was still paying like $8 an hour when it got unionized. And uh, you would make a little bit of tips, but I found out that the other clubs, you don't get an hourly rate and it's just based on tips. So I moved on to other clubs and I was making two to $3,000 a night, which was unbelievable for me. I never made money like that. And that was at a very, that was a while ago. So that was just at the start of the tech boom. And even though I'm only 25, that was in 19. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a couple people got that. Uh, 19, I want to say 94, that I started. I started dancing in strip clubs. Uh, so I, when I was in grad school, I was really referencing some of the work I had done, some of the people I had met, and I, grew, I was really interested in labor, and I was really interested in the way that women are, are perceived by. Uh, other people when they're in the labor of the sex industry, right? And, um, and I was also really interested in um, the kind of abjectness, I think, that a lot of people kind of perceive, perceive uh, sex workers. And, um, and then in trying to kind of convey this, I was also referencing my own aesthetic. And my own aesthetic, if I went back to Islamic art, well, Islamic art basically there's, there's, um, there's an idea that, that there should be 
pattern and design, but that the physical body should not be present. And so I started to think about that, and I thought, hmm, how do I talk about sex workers while I also don't show the body? So I started playing around with that, and here I have a steel eye beam that's being suspended up with two little pins by a bikini strap, and it's a bright orange bikini strap that a lot of girls I knew would, would dance with. And then I started to play around even more and do installations. This was a room installation, and um, you actually, I, I tried uh, as often as I could to make it so that if a viewer wanted to go in and look at the works, they'd actually have to kind of change their physicality. I mean, unless you were in a wheelchair, you would have to duck to go in. And, um, and then uh, you could just have the crotches right in your face. Um, as you walked in. This was through the hallways of my grad school, and so every time people wanted to go to their studios, they had to pass under the legs of all of these different names, the most common names that you would find in strip clubs that I, um, I uh, kind of carved out in acrylic and hung. And then I just kept playing around with it. You know, I was asked to kind of reflect on Palestinian resistance, and I did it from the perspective of, of uh, obviously, sex workers. And so I have them there weighed down by stones, but also as a slingshot. Um, this was in Old Town, Pasadena. I got to do an installation right out of grad school, and so uh, I played around with light, and I, and I uh, wrote different, uh, different statements inside the, the bodies. This was my MFA show. And um, again, uh, I, I adjusted the, the architecture of the room, and I, you had to kind of bow down to go in, and if you could go up into the uh, sculpture itself and stick your head in, and if you spun around slowly, there were letters on all of, um, all of the crotches, and you, know, you could get a little message. <laughs> I did this installation shortly after grad school where I, uh, this is a, uh, an I-beam that, that weighs a ton, and it's suspended by uh, one orange bikini that, you know, the spider web kind, I don't know if you guys have ever seen those. So it's suspended by one spider web bikini. And um, I really, with this series, I really wanted to talk about the fragility, but also the durability of so many of the people that are involved in this industry. I wanted to reference the body uh, without actually having the presence of the body. I wanted to, um, you know, show pattern clearly uh, without actually uh, being didactic with pattern and being too abstract because I, I, I went to a CGU and CGU is an abstract painter school and um, I was like, I never want to see another splatter of paint again in my life. Um, I moved on and now I, I appreciate splatters of paint in a different way um, and I've had students that do splatters of paint. but. Um, but that just wasn't the direction I wanted to take my work in. And, and abstraction for me, I was also like a long time commie. And, and uh, you know, I, I, have you guys ever read Schiffer Goldman? Incredible art historian. Um, but Schiffer would talk about, you know, abstraction as a tool <laughs> of capitalism. And, um, and I, was, I was definitely the, um, the anti-abstraction at the time in particular. And, um, and then I continued to do these bikinis. I mean, for a while I really stopped, actually, because I was starting to get called the bikini girl. And, um, and I, I didn't like that. I, I didn't want to have a niche. And I'm, I'm gonna get into that a little bit, why I didn't want to have a niche. No, I can actually tell you right now. In grad school, I was, they were like, no, just do one thing. Stick to one thing and make it kind of like, just do a constant practice and meditation on one thing. Because in my grad school, it is a really great grad school, and I've gone on to, to do adjunct, um, to be adjunct faculty there at the CGU, but that's a school that if you want to become an artist who is marketable, who can go into commercial galleries, they prepare you for that. And that is not really what I wanted to do. I was really interested in not being marketable and, um, and not being put into any kind of categories. And I was really, against the notion that my, my ideas, that my visual philosophy was going to become capital. So that, of course, had a, a, a big uh, conflict with the fact that I also like to pay rent and eat food and all of that stuff. But anyway, um, I, I did definitely have a conflict with that. So I pulled myself away right away. I was like, no, 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 I'm not the bikini girl, and uh, started, to, started to do other work. 
uh, years later, I was invited to do an exhibition in Tehran, and uh, they said, we want your bikini work. And I was like, oh, yes. Tehran? Yes. I'm bringing, I'm bringing bikini work. And so this installation, I wanted it to look like the dome of, of a shrine that I really love called Shabdolazim. Is Amy here? Amy's not here because Amy would know what Shabdolazim is, but anyway. <laughs> Um, here is, you know, the installation in Tehran again. And then just recently, this last spring, I did an installation with mostly paintings, uh, but also I did this installation in one of the, the rooms of a gallery that, that does represent, I am represented by a gallerist that's really not very smart, obviously. <laughs> um, and, uh, and she, I put this up and she, this looks banal here. This is just, I mean, if you saw it in, per, in person, yes, there's like crotches and stuff in your face. But um, in Tehran, um, you know, there's definitely a censorship around sexuality. And in particular, when, when it comes to the female body. Now, I'm not going to say that that doesn't exist in this country, because there's a, there's a few installations that I've actually omitted from this talk, because it's not really relevant. I've been censored more in the United States than I have in Iran. But um, here in this, in, in this sculpture, I mean, when I put this up, this installation, she, the night before, she told me, I could not sleep. I, I don't know how we're going to show this. I'm going to get shut down. I'm going to get thrown in jail. She was very afraid. She's like, you're going to get thrown in jail. You're not going to be able to fly back home. So I was like, don't worry about it. We'll just put a little shield up. So we put a shield up, and then I just walked people in individually. But this is the last bikini installation I've done. But I played around. I did play around with the notions of and um, this is one of the very first drawings that I did. And um, I have many, many, many of these works. I'm not going to show you all of them. But, um, but this, this one I called Jende. This was one of the first, like I said. And Jende in Farsi means whore. Uh, but it also, it, it also means that the jinn, the little, the little demons that, that kind of come in and, and are mischievous, that those little demons have taken over your body. So you can almost say that, well, I'm, I'm only a whore because the little demons took over my body. <laughs> it's not really me. But I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely excited about exploring the notions of being a whore. Uh, I, either that being like sexually promiscuous or that being sex for sale. Um, the, the labeling of whore. And I played around with that quite a bit. Like I said, this last spring, I had a solo exhibition in, in Tehran at Oral Gallery, and I did a series of paintings. It was called uh, Mahvash Parivash and Friends. It was named after a, a, a song, a kind of, a song that's, that's considered a, um, you know, in, in Iran, it's not, it's not a classy song. It's like, it's low life, right? But it's a really extraordinarily beautiful song. And, um, and uh, it names off the names of kind of common girls, you know, common poor girls. That's what, how people know it. And I, there's no other way to say it. it it's a link with, with class and society, right? And, um, and so I really wanted it to be about sex work in Tehran. And so I played around with different, different designs. And um, again, we see the presence of the female body. We see the sexual presence of the female body without the actual presence of the body. We see Islamic art, but we also see very sacrilegious art. And, um, and you know, I played around with like really scandalous. I and mean, this is like the, the backside of, of uh, a woman that's that's kind of squatting down like, like this. Um, and, um, and she has, you know, a really small thong. This is also the backside of a woman that's kind of laying on her back. And she's got red bottom shoes on. And um, this is, uh, you know, this is the, the evil eye. Uh, keeps away from evil eye. Not as we, as we call it. I'm going to go back to 2001 <coughs> right now, because that one kind of spanned throughout the years up to the, to the present. And in 2001, I created a series. That I actually started this series before the major iconoclasm that the United States got to experience. Can anyone think of what that major iconoclasm was? Yes, absolutely, yes. So, um, so just before that, I was, watching, I was watching the destruction of the giant Buddha in Afghanistan by the Taliban. 
And I was like, I mean, I was riveted when I saw the video. I was like, oh, wow. I mean, it was such, it was so tragic and also so uh, violent. But also, it took my brain to a lot of different places. And, um, and so I started playing around. I got a bunch of uh, postcards. And I played around with, with people I, I loved. Like, I mean, my email address is Ami Loves Che. So, uh, you know, I love Che. But, but I, I don't like him as an icon. I, I don't want to idolize him. In, in any way, and I don't think anyone should, because I think that people don't understand the essence of, of what he did, and the complexities of, of what he was about. Um, I, however, I, I cannot stand Princess Diana. And so I did put a, a, a minaret, a, a very, very old minaret, um, on her face from Iraq. And uh, British Petroleum had almost everything to do with what happened in Iraq throughout the many years. I love Tupac, but you know, I, I had to do it to him. <laughs> and um, I, there, were, there were a hundred total. I was asked also to get together a show because at that time in 2001, uh, in LA, nobody knew of any Muslim women artists and they wanted to show Muslim women because we've got we've to give them a voice because they're so voiceless. And um, yeah, I'm so voiceless, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, I got together uh, a couple of friends, Gita Kashabi and my friend uh, Lida Abdul, and we did uh, an exhibition. The only thing is that they didn't tell us that in the front of the exhibition, they were going to have all of the photographs that uh, people took of 9-11 happening. So civilians who were just witnessing it. So it was just devastation, right? I mean, you can imagine the tragic photographs. And what was happening was Americans walked through and they were um, confronted with, with the notion that they were they were severely victimized, and then they walked in the back and they were like, oh, and then these bitches, and, <laughs> and then this bitch in particular. So I yeah I got I got death threats. Um, I've done a lot of shrine installations, and shrines are super important to me. My last name is Motavali, which means keeper of the shrine, and so I've kind of stuck to that. I've I've created numerous installations and sculptures around shrines. And I've always been really intrigued by that. Um, when I was about 21 years old though, and I see shrines in different ways. Um, I, yeah, shrines, shrines sometimes when they're in public, and in, in definitely in the Middle East, but also here, they are, they are public art in the realest sense. I mean, it's a way that a community comes together and decides on an homage to something or someone, right? Uh, what I didn't like about the history of shrines in my part of the world was that, you know, anyone who had enough money could kind of buy themselves a shrine. Mm -hmm. And so they could say, I'm an Imam Zadeh, yes, here's my money, and when I die, make sure you, you erect something in my name. And so I was really interested in the iconoclasm of that, and bringing in the notion of shrines in the United States. When I was 21 years old, there was a guy that I was, uh, I was very good friends with, uh, I was dating, to be honest with you, I was dating, and um, I was waiting for him to call me because he was gonna, we were gonna meet up, he wasn't gonna pick me up, he didn't have a car. We were gonna meet up and we we're gonna hang out. And uh, he didn't call, he didn't call. And I was like, this, again, you yeah, know, he does this all the time. Turned out, I found out, I got a phone call from his mother the next day. He was shot and killed, he was shot in the back, um, right off of Hoover Street. And, um, and uh, he was shot and killed in front of a bunch of people. He was shot when he was running away from the police, pulling up his pants, and um, just left on the street for a long time for people to see. And his family and the people of the neighborhood, all his friends, they were never the same. Never the same. That was many, many years ago. I'm 25 now, but that was somehow the 20, 27 years ago. Uh, anyway, that was quite a while ago. And ever since then, I didn't know how to process it. It takes me a while to process things. But unfortunately, in uh, 2004, uh, I was teaching in 2001 at this great high school called Locke High School. And I'm going to get into that because we're going to talk about iconoclasm there too. But uh, I was teaching at Locke High School and um, 
a few years later, one of my former students uh, texted me and said, my little sister just got killed. I was like, she's 18 months old. I, who the hell would kill her? How did she get killed? So her father and, and his father and mother got into an argument. Father picked up the baby, went over to his shop. He had a shop on Avalon. And this is south southeast LA, just just north of just north and a little bit west of Watts. And um, he he went over to his shop, had the baby with him. She called the cops because she didn't know where the baby went. They went over to his shop. They didn't bring psychologists or anything. They just confronted the dude. Had a bunch of guns. Confronted him, and he was angry. So he shouted at them. No one negotiated with him at all. Within minutes, bullets, I mean hundreds of bullets from all around riddled his shop. He was holes throughout his whole body. He was Swiss cheese. So was the 18 month old baby. And, um, and so after that, we were out on the street for many, many nights, many nights. And um, no one really cared. The cops didn't really care. And even having conversations with people, people were like, well, maybe they did something. You know, I mean, there must have been a reason. I'm trying to think, what did an 18-month-old do? But even, even not the 18-month-old, even the father. There could be some kind of negotiation. There couldn't be somebody who actually sits and, like you see on TV, negotiates with this family? No. So I started working on some posters. I didn't include that poster because it was actually not. It's kind of didactic, so I'm, I was kind of bored with it. But right after that, I started making stencils. And, um, and stencils were, were really, really, really important to me. And actually, I know um, Allegra knows about uh, this stencil, at least some of these. Um, we've worked together on them. You've helped me cut them, too, right? Yeah, yeah which is really painful. But not, not nearly the pain that, obviously, people feel when, when they're uh, subjected to, to, to this type of violence. But um, I started doing stencils in the locations that people were shot and killed by police. And this was a way of me keeping the shrine going. This was a way of me being a keeper of the shrine. And so I would go to the location, I would spray paint it, and um, it would pretty much get taken down or painted over in a little while. But at least there was an homage. And the community needed something to be able to heal after such violence had happened and such an act of a militarized aggression happened in their neighborhood in the place that people want to call home. So um, right here there's there's a portrait of Christian Portillo who was my friend because in 2008 I was asked to do a, an installation. I was, I was a resident artist at 18th Street Art Center in Santa Monica and I was asked to do an installation and while I'm doing research I said yeah I think I'm gonna do research and create a shrine that looks like my family's shrine but base it around the people who been shot and killed by police in Los Angeles County within the year. And unfortunately, my friend Christian got killed that summer. I got the news of that on July 23rd. July 23rd happens to be my father's birthday. And um, his, his brother called me and said they just killed Christian. And, um, and I was like, what? So I rushed over and his parents told the story. Christian was waiting in his car. His girlfriend was inside, and he was just kind of waiting. It was actually her car. He was waiting. He had a cell phone, and he was on his phone. Uh, a sheriff's car went down. This is in Lenox. Lenox is, is, um, is uh, patrolled by the sheriffs. And um, the sheriff's car went down to the end of the block, parked, and quietly, stealthily, one of the sheriffs came up, sees him, to his account, uh, you know, Christian had a gun. Christian had his phone and sees him and shot him. And Christian's hit the end of his phone was actually lodged inside his heart. They found a piece of, of his phone in his heart. He had no weapon. And then what was interesting is I started to do some research around how how they justify the killings. And I and I noticed through a lot of work, and I've done a lot of work with, with various um, collectives on, on uh, the trolling that happens on the internet. But there's tons of, of uh, spaces on the internet where um, 
people who actually work for the police department and they police. They police all of the information that goes up. So family members would go up and say, you know, that was my friend. We went to school together. And I can't believe this happened. And he was actually a really great person. And no, he was never a drug dealer. I never saw him. I've, I've never seen him with a gun. And of course, there was somebody on there trolling, always trying to put down that person. So not only was that person Christian in this case, well, not only was Christian killed in front of his parents, and then his parents held a gunpoint, but then he was killed again and again and again in newspapers, on the internet, in every avenue that the sheriffs and police departments and, and their various unions could get to, and their various supporters. He kept getting killed. He kept getting killed. He kept getting defamed. So did his family. So I continued with this work. I continued for a while, and there is there is much more momentum now um, than there has been, but clearly not enough to make it stop, right? And um, this was this was a march that that we did. Um, I think it was on Christian's birthday, um, and this was uh, not too long ago, actually, down the street from my house. David Martinez um, killed in Echo Park. Uh, shot um, and then survived a few days and, and uh, died a few days after. So um, I didn't get to go back to Iran for a very long time. My family migrated here in 1977. It was before the revolution in Iran, which was 1979. And uh, we came because my family, actually one of the few families that came to the United States to get away from the Shah, um, who, was, who was the king. The Shah means king in Farsi. Um, so we uh, came here to get away from, from what was going on there. And, um, and I financially and also just so many reasons couldn't go back for a very long time. And finally in 2005 I went back. Um, this is a video still from something I did. And this is my, my I, I was really interested in the ritual around shrines and the way that people engage with shrines. And this is my family's shrine. And that's my aunt uh, going around it with me, my aunt Shafnaz. Um, the only thing is that, that this shrine in Iran, uh, even shrines became uh, bureaucratic and it all got taken over. The, it, I've, I've learned something interesting from Iran and, and some of the, the ways that, that, that nationalization works. And, um, and the state took over the shrines, and they've knocked down the ways that the, the community came together and made this beautiful wooden shrine. When you touched it, it felt amazing. And they knocked it down, and they made all shrines uniform. They all look the same. They have all, they're all made of brass and look identical everywhere you go. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like that currently. But this is the shrine that I created. So I, I uh, carved this. I after after. This murder, and then I, I, I witnessed uh, two murders that, that year as well. Um, I cut a residency. Someone nominated me for an award and a residency just to, I guess, get away because I have severe PTSD. And um, I went up to Montalvo, and during a month, I just carved and carved and carved and carved, and it was the most healing and amazing thing I did. And I carved the faces of different people into the shrine, and I also carved the geometric grid. And then I, um, I wrote a, a prayer that you give for for um, people who've been martyred. And so in Iran, it's, it's a, a, a prayer for the martyred. And this piece is called Hadama Masumim, that shall have far threshold of the innocence and martyred. And I wanted to to really um, I wanted to shift the notion of of what shrines are dedicated to. Like I said, it was generally someone who was very wealthy, or sometimes it was someone who was considered holy, religiously holy. And I wanted to shift it, and I wanted it to make it make it about everyday people. Then I got to, um, uh, people asked me to show the shrine in different places, and I had actually uh, given it on loan to an institution, and so I didn't have it. So I made paper versions of it. You see on the left, it was in Oaxaca, and then on the right, it was in um, Chicago, and I adjusted it each time to reflect the places that it was going to so that it could show people who had been killed in those communities. And um, there it is again. And then when I, when I originally opened this piece, I also performed inside. I would perform inside every, every Saturday 
um, afternoon for about two hours. And what I did was I, I uh, compiled lists of, of uh, incidents of militarized aggression that killed, um, killed civilians all over the world. And so I wrote all of these incidents on a plexiglass layer that I had created inside. And so it's kind of sacrilegious to make, put myself in, inside of the shrine. But I did that, and, and I wrote backwards. I wrote all of the stories. And while I was there, I got to meet a bunch of people who, um, who Sorry. who knew the people that I was documenting. And it was, it was really an extraordinary experience. Uh, I've done many manifestations of that. I've collaborated with students at various schools, and, and um, that was really amazing, working with students, because uh, you know, it's, it, it no longer was my project in the way that I envisioned it. It became a whole other thing. It became this, this uh, project that, that took on, like there was one Tumblr page that uh, some students at, at Loyola and I made that uh, basically tried to dig up the, the, remember I was telling you how there, there were stories that were fabricated around people who were killed. And so the students, this group of students at Loyola and I were, were creating an alternative narrative by finding, finding things that family members and other people said and trying to create something out of the human being that was killed beyond that violent day, that violent moment, that you know they played guitar or you know they were an uncle or whatever, um, or you know however it was, they were daughters, they were sisters, they were brothers. I um, was asked on Palm Sunday a few years ago to do a performance, and it was actually inside of. It, there's a gallery that is inside a Catholic church, and it was Palm Sunday. It was very strange. And they had created a, um, a lab, so it, it, there's there's a part of uh, a niche in, in, in the gallery that faces east, southeast, you know, towards uh, Mecca. And so I did a performance, which is a kind of oh, I kind of dressed like that today too, uh, which is a classic performance that that um, Iranians do during the month of Ashura. Anyone know about the month of Ash Ashura? Um, basically, it's. Uh, you guys have heard of uh, Shiites. Please don't call us Shiites. We're Shia, <laughs> but the Shia population, there's a whole month of mourning, uh, which actually, it, it's interesting because like they, they have these uh, parades and, and events, rituals that happen, but it's mostly like a time that people come out in the streets and, and, uh, and it's a pickup scene. It's kind of like a cruise scene. I know it sounds strange, but there's this whole ritual around mourning where um, people will, uh, Men in particular will, but women do sometimes too, will pound their chest. And they pound it to a rhythm. And they do it together. And they'll be kind of chanting or singing a song while they're pounding their chest like this. So there's their chest, their chest cavity becomes a drum. And so I did research on people who've been killed in the Bay Area that year. And that was the year Alex Nieto. I don't know if any of you guys know about the story of Alex Nieto in, in the Bay Area. Basically was killed because um, some some person who had just moved into the mission decided that he looked creepy and called the police on him and he was killed because he was, he was eating a burrito in, in the park. But um, it, was, it was a pretty intense situation in the Bay Area. People were very angry about it. But there were many, many people who were killed that year. Um, and this was, I was doing the research from the start of the year of 2014, which was January, and this performance was Palm Sunday. 28 people. Palm Sunday. That's not a year. That's that's a quarter of a year. 28 people in the Bay Area. It's absurd. So I did this performance. And then in 20, 2015, I was asked to be part of uh, uh, a performance uh, biennial in Chicago. And, um, and I work with uh, some friends that are part of uh, an organization called We, we Charge Genocide. They actually, um, they actually charged genocide on, on the um, Chicago PD and took them to international tribunal um, for torture. And um, I found out through them that they're at Holman Park, Holman Square Park in Chicago. Behind us on the other side, kind of uh, to my left, I guess, 
there's a there's a big building and it's a police block site and that's a site where um, where young men in particular would get uh, profiled and taken in and, and uh, tortured and um, I did research on uh, the people that were killed within a, a close uh, in about a year span and I put their faces on um, faces names age in loving memory that's what I always write I, I put it on uh, kites and I went out to Homewood Park and just, uh, there were a bunch of kids there and they just decided to help me fly the kites. And so we flew a whole bunch of kites over Home Homewood Square Park um, so that it could fly above that black site that is torturing so many people. Um, right out of grad school, I started teaching at one school and then I was hired as a full-time teacher at this amazing place called Locke High School. And I was really excited because when I was in high school, there was a boy that I was talking to who went to Lock High School. He was a dancer. He was a uh, he was a pop mom. And um, and I mean, talking to literally would just sit on the phone for like hours. <laughs> and I had this idea that Lock was this amazing creative space that so much went on there because literally so many incredible um, musical and dance and visual artists have come out of Lock High School. So I was so excited. I was going to be their first art teacher and. 12 years and not a bit of a full-time art teacher. Um, so I got hired in 1999 and um, when I went there it was um, it was really chaotic but I mean I kind of knew uh, high school you know public high schools to be chaotic but it got more and more and more chaotic to the point that children were going to school and they were starting a criminal record school because of the conditions of the school and so uh, kids would show up and 30% of their classes would have no teacher at all. No one. Not even a person unlock the door and let them in. Kids would just be roaming the halls all day long. And in that class, let's say it's chemistry that they're signed up for that has no teacher whatsoever, they would just get an arbitrary grade at the end of the semester. It would just be like, okay, you got to see. See for what? I mean, there was nothing to assess, really. Nobody ever showed up in front of them. So it was very chaotic, and after many, many violent events, and many events of extreme injustice, my students who, uh, I had a group of students in my studio art classes. Studio art is a great place. Anybody here studying visual art, studio artists? No studio artists here? <laughs> what, all right. But what, I mean, you know, when, when you're in a studio art class, especially when you're kind of in that environment where it's, where it's group, it's a great space that could potentially bring up great dialogue. And so, so that became a space where kids were talking about a lot of things at, at Lock High School and the extreme conditions. And so we organized. And um, we organized with uh, parents and community members. And, um, and we held a, a public meeting that you know this was our flyer for. So, um, so we held this meeting, we didn't know who was going to show up. It turned out the ACLU showed up to this. Oh, what a disaster they created. I'll tell you about that. But um, anyway, and the students put out a list of demands. I mean, it seems reasonable, but um, these were just things that were happening or not happening that were completely unjust. And they were really taking away from so many of uh, the constitutional rights of students because if, if people you know keep talking about what a great place America is, okay, well if you're talking about what a great constitution we have, okay, well how come so many people don't have access to it? And so a, a lot of students didn't have the, the the civil their civil rights were being violated and their basic human rights were being violated just by going to school and they had to go to school. If they didn't go to school, well you know what happens if you don't go to school. So um, so as a result of this organizing, I was pinpointed, even though I, there's no way I'm smart enough to come up with these demands. The students came up with these demands. Um, even though I didn't come up with the demands, I just helped support the, the students. I was one of three teachers that, that um, supported the students. I was targeted as the organizer. Um, and that I, I, they actually said that I was creating a cell, a terror cell. This was before 9-11. <laughs> I was creating a terrorist cell at Long High School. <laughs> so, um, I love the, the artwork of uh, Adrian Piper. If you don't know who Adrian Piper is, please, please look her up. Um, but, and there's going to be an amazing retrospective of her work curated by a, a good friend at the Hammer that's 
that will blow you away. She's a really, really extraordinary artist. So um, she did an amazing piece called uh, Self-Portrait, uh, Exaggerating My Negroid Features. And so I did an homage to that, and I created Self-Portrait, Exaggerating Me as a Terrorist. And um, this was uh, a, an assignment I gave to students where we did self-portrait. So first we would do the grid method, which you see up at the top there. And then we would do, uh, uh, based on that, a line drawing. But instead of using line, we would use words. And I would have kids do a kind of, um, what is it? When, uh, uh, stream of consciousness writing. So um, the rest of it, this giant one, is, is a portrait of me with stream of consciousness writing about the experiences and what, what me and my students went through after organizing at Long High School. On the left are the two lesson plans, and then on the bottom are two of my five pink slips. So I got five pink slips, and the attorneys that were hired, and this all happened because actually ACLU was there, and ACLU decided to fire off a letter telling the school district that they may not retaliate against me or they will take action, and I didn't even know. So, <laughs> and they didn't know I was behind, I was doing any kind of support for this group, so they, they put me on blast, and, um, and then they decided not to take any action. Uh, of course, I was lucky enough to have this incredible attorney, Dan Stormer, back me up. We went to court. Um, the jury found uh, unanimously in my favor, and um, the judge overthrew it because the, the case did happen after 9-11. 9-11 changed everything, everything. And um, one of the things that we were in particular contesting, and one of the reasons that I was really targeted was because they were doing random searches in classrooms, which were not random at all. They were targeted. And so two times I, I, uh, I turned away the police and, and administration from doing the searches in my classroom. And so the last time they dragged me out of the class. And um, any of you guys listen to Thundercat? You guys have heard of that? So he was my student. He was, he was one of